Now, beginning in verse 17, it says, He bringing his cross went forth into the place which is called a place of the skull, which is called in the Hebrew, excuse me, Golgotha. And they crucified him with two other with him, one on one side and the other, and Jesus in the midst. And Pilate wrote a title and put it on the cross, and the writing was Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. And this title read many of the Jews, for the place where Jesus was crucified was nigh to the city, and it was written in Hebrew, in Greek, and in Latin. Then said the chief priest of the Jews to Pilate, Write not that he's the king of the Jews, but that he said, I, that I am the, not, write not that he said, but that he said, I am the king of the Jews. And Pilate answered, what I've written, I have written. The death by crucifixion is a very, very cruel, harsh, wicked, violent way to die. It was so violent and so horrible that no Roman citizen was allowed to be put to death or executed by crucifixion. Cicero said that it was the most cruel and horrifying way to die. Tacitus, the Roman historian, he said that it was a despicable death. So it was, an, it was a form of capital punishment that the Assyrians actually devised. It was used by the Phoenicians and then it was used by the Persians. But it was also practiced and then picked up by the Romans. And so during the time of Christ, one of the ways that they would execute criminals and make a spectacle of them was by crucifixion. Crucifixion was a horrible way to die. They would actually have you carry the cross piece and you would carry it through the streets and they would make a mockery of you. They would be carrying the sign we see that they put over Jesus' head saying your name and your crimes that you committed. Then they would get to the place of execution. They would actually nail your feet to the cross, to the cross beams. They would stretch out your hands, and then they would drive nails through your hands or through the wrist. Sometimes they would tie them with ropes. And initially, the crucifixion, there was no foot rest and there was no rest for the body. The Romans, showing a little bit of mercy, put a foot rest in and a place for them to rest on because you would die of exposure to the sun, you would die of thirst, you would die of asphyxiation, you couldn't breathe, and you'd have to push yourself up there to breathe. And some would sit on the cross for many, many hours before they would die. We're going to see as they would run the spirit to the side of Christ, rather than leaving him there on the Sabbath day, that Jesus was, uh, was on the cross for several hours. The thieves that were with him they were, they were thrust with a spear, or their legs were broken, excuse me, and then Jesus was thrust with a spear, and out came the blood and water, and they determined that he had already died, that his legs were indeed not broken. So Jesus suffered on a Roman cross. And here, in very simple statement, John does not focus on the physical sufferings of the cross, but rather John focuses on the words that he uttered when he hung upon the cross. But I want you to note, going back to verse 17 and 18, that he bearing his cross, Jesus carried his cross. Now, the stories in the other synoptic gospels make it clear that halfway to Calvary or Golgotha, that Jesus was falling under the weight of the cross and that they compelled, as the Roman law would allow them to do, one Simon of Cyrene, and he carried the cross for Jesus, but he's on the way, verse 17, of what we now know to be the Via della Rosa, the way of the cross. And so they come to a place that is called in the Hebrew Golgotha, and John doesn't mention, but in the Latin, it's also known as Calvary. So Golgotha and Calvary, one is Aramaic or Hebrew, and the other one is Latin, both mean the cross. And we don't know for sure where this location is. There's Gordon's Calvary with the garden tomb and other places, and they have the, tomb, the, the church of the Holy Sepulchre and so forth, where they believe Jesus was crucified and then buried. But we don't know where Jesus approximately today was crucified, 
nor also know where he was buried. But they came to this place of the skull. Why it was called Golgotha or Calvary, we don't know. Some feel that that the shape of the hill that he was on was in the shape of a skull. Some say it was a place of execution. So there was actually skulls laying around the area there. But they crucified him. That's the statement, very simple and quick and to the point. They, verse 18, crucified him and two other with him, one on one side and Jesus in the midst. Now, what I want to focus on there are only four of them, are the words that Jesus spoke while he hung on the cross. Jesus hung on the cross from nine in the morning till three in the afternoon. And the first three hours from nine to noon, Jesus uttered certain statements. And then from noon till three in the afternoon was when there was the darkness and there was the earthquake and the rocks were rent and the earth shook and then Jesus dismissed his spirit. But the first cry in the text that we see here, it wasn't the first cry that he uttered, was what I want to call verse 18, the word or the cry of salvation. And the background is given to us in verse 18, two other with him on either side and one, and Jesus in the midst. Now we know that when Jesus was crucified, He was not the only one crucified at that time on Calvary. That next to him on one side and on the other side were two thieves and robbers, criminals, and they were being executed as well. Now we know the story from the other synoptics that one or both of the thieves were at first reviling him and cursing him. And then one of the thieves, the repentant thief, this is one of the most beautiful stories in all the Bible, the penitent thief, turned to his friend. He said, "Uh, don't you fear God? We're here for our crimes. We've done crimes and we're here justly paying for what we've done. But this man has done nothing amiss. Now, my theory is, is that for those first three hours or so that this man on the cross was listening to the words of Jesus. And one of the words he uttered probably prior to this was early on the cross, he said, Father, what? Forgive them. They know not what they do. And there's little doubt in my mind that those words pierced his heart like an arrow. And he began to have hope stir in his heart, thinking, well, maybe he is the Son of God. Maybe he is the Savior. Maybe he can forgive me. And so he's actually on the cross, dying for his crimes, guilty sinner that he was, but hope began to well within his heart. And think about in proximity how close he was to the Son of God dying for his very sins. So two thieves equally close, and then the one thief actually turned to the Lord and said, Lord, remember me when you enter into your kingdom. And what did Jesus say to him? He said, today, and actually, He actually said, truly, I tell you. It's not recorded in John's gospel, but if you get the full account, harmonize the gospel. Truly, I tell you that today you will be with me in paradise. Isn't that an amazing story? That Jesus would turn to this repentant thief on the cross and he would offer him salvation and assurance that today you will be with me in paradise. Paradise. This is truly an amazing situation. Let me give you some reasons it was amazing. First of all, it was a fulfillment of Bible prophecy, in case you didn't know it. In Isaiah chapter 53 and verse 12, it says, He was numbered with the transgressors. That he was numbered with transgressors. Actually, Isaiah way before Jesus was crucified, prophesied. And all through our text tonight, we actually have a ton of fulfilled prophecies. That in the Old Testament, the prophet Isaiah actually spoke of Messiah being crucified in chapter 53, but that he would actually be crucified between thieves or numbered with transgressors. We also see God's providence in that these thieves were both there, both had opportunity One, no doubt, died 
in unrepentance. The other one repented and was saved and went with Christ to paradise. So the picture and the reminder is that Jesus came to do what? Save sinners. And isn't it amazing that the very last thing he did before he died was reach out and save this poor lost sinner? How amazing is that? And it brought brought an amazing salvation. It was amazing because this man was guilty of crimes. He was a sinner. Now, a lot of doctrine built into this story because it shows us that we're saved by God's grace, not by our good works. What if Jesus would have turned to this thief at this moment and said, "Uh, you're not going to go to heaven. You're a bad person. You're dying for crimes that you've committed and you're a wicked person. Or what if he would have said, but you haven't been baptized. But you haven't been confirmed. But you haven't taken communion. But you're not one of my disciples. Christ died for sinners. Guess what? That includes me and you. You know, sometimes people come to the Lord's table like we are tonight, and they feel like, I'm not good enough. I'm too wicked of a person. I'm too much of a sinner. Take communion tonight. Guess what? Jesus died for sinners. Amen. That's what the blood and the bread is a symbol of. His body broken for you and his blood shed. Without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sins. But with that precious blood of Christ, Peter says, that our sins can indeed be forgiven. So it was an amazing salvation. And that was also amazing, not because of just who he was, but because of what he did. He, number one, realized at this time in his life that he needed a Savior. He needed more than just being saved. Earlier, they were saying, if you're the Messiah, if you're the Savior, save yourself and us too. If you're the miracle worker they say you are, then take us down from this cross and save us But he kind of got through that and realized, no, I need salvation from my sins. Not just physical rescue, but I need to be saved from my sins. And then he recognized that Jesus was indeed the Savior. At that very moment, he realized, he said, Lord, remember me when you enter into your kingdom. This guy had his theology correct. He's a thief. He's dying for crimes. He's on a cross. And he turns and says, you're Lord, and you have a kingdom, and I want you to remember me. I know you can save me. And he called on the Lord. The Bible says, whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And if you happen to be here tonight and you're not saved, you can do the same thing, calling on the name of the Lord and being saved. So he committed himself to Jesus personally. Now, when I look at his salvation on this cross, I want to note six things. Number one, it was wholly by God's grace. It was totally, completely, and wholly by God's grace. He didn't deserve it. But guess what? That's the only way God saves sinners. God doesn't save sinners by the law. God doesn't save sinners by rites or rituals. He saves us by his grace. And I know you've heard it a million times, but grace is unearned, undeserved, unmerited favor. If you did anything to save yourself, then it's not totally grace. You say, well, don't I have to repent? Don't I have to believe? Yeah, but that's not a work. You're not meriting anything. You're just changing your mind, turning to Jesus, and trusting him to save you. Salvation is of the Lord. We can't take any credit for it. It's by grace. Paul says in Ephesians, by grace you have been saved through faith. That not of yourself, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Secondly, his salvation was secure in that he said, truly, truly, today you will be with me in paradise. Jesus didn't say, if you're lucky, maybe, you better cross your fingers, hang on to your rabbit foot, and hope and pray to God that you get to go to heaven. I believe that if you are a Christian, you can rest assured that you will go to heaven when you die. And that if Jesus comes back for the church, you're going to go up in the rapture. Sometimes people think you've got to be a part of the deeper life club to get raptured. Well, the rapture is only for super saints, 
people who are really deep into Jesus, really on fire. And I'm not by any means trying to encourage you to be a carnal Christian, but you're either a Christian or you're not a Christian. And I see so, so many Christians that feel like, I don't know if I'll get raptured because I'm not really spiritual enough. If you're a Christian, you'll go up in the rapture. You're a part of the body of Christ. So he was saved by grace. He was secure in God's grace. His salvation was personal. Today, you will be with me in paradise. And it was a present possession today, not some distant future date. And then fifthly, it's centered in Christ. Jesus said, today you will be with me. The reason this thief was saved, because he trusted in Jesus Christ, not in his own goodness or righteousness. And it was a glorious salvation in that he said, today you're going to be where? You're going to be with me in paradise. I love that. Now, I got all that in the white spaces there in verse 18. If you put together the synoptic gospels, you can draw that from the story of the thief on the cross. Now, the statement on the sign over the cross where Jesus hung was actually, this is Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. And what they put on the cross is true. And how bizarre that is. So God, even in his death was protecting his identity and his testimony of who he was. The Jews got all up in arms. They got all upset and they go, no, 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 no. Change that to, he said, I am the king of the Jews. Not, he is the king of the Jews. And so Pilate finally, you know, kind of had enough of these Jews and being pushed around by them. And he said, what I've written, I have written. And that's a little too, little too late. Would to God he would have stood up sooner, but he didn't. And so the, the superscription over his head was written in three languages, Hebrew, Greek, and Latin. So the Jews spoke Hebrew, some have Aramaic here. Then the Greeks, which was the universal language uh, that was in the Roman Empire. And then the philosophers spoke Latin. Some say Hebrew speaks of religion, the Greek speaks of philosophy, and the Latin conveys the concept of law. And again, John's gospel is universal gospel. So Jesus came to die for the sins of the whole world. God so loved the world. So everyone could read it. And it was in a busy place outside the city walls of Jerusalem where everyone could see that. And so the soldiers then, verse 23, when they had took Jesus or crucified Jesus, took his garments, made four parts to every soldier apart. So it would indicate that there were four soldiers, and they took his head band or his head his headdress, they took his sandals, they took his belt or his girdle, then they took his outward coat or tunic, and then they took the inner tunic, and it was one piece, and they didn't want to tear it and ruin it, and so they cast lots to see who could get that piece of clothing. Evidently, the Roman soldiers would be able to take the clothes from the criminals that they executed. So they said, therefore, among themselves, verse 24, let us not rend it, but cast lots for it, whose it shall be, that the scripture might be fulfilled, which saith, notice verse 24, they parted my remnant among them, and for my vesture they did cast lots. These things, therefore, the soldiers did. Now they did that again. Here's another prophecy. And again, we're seeing that God's word is given by inspiration, that it's inspired by God so he can speak prophetically, that they would cast lots for his tunic or his vesture, and as prophesied, write it down, Psalm 22 and verse 18. That's a messianic psalm where 2,000 years before Jesus was ever on the scene, the psalmist wrote about them casting lots for his vesture. Actually, it was a thousand years, excuse me, Psalm 22, verse 18, before Jesus ever came on the scene. So it's a reminder that the Bible is God's word. The psalmist spoke in detail, and it was fulfilled. Uh, many years ago, uh, there was a book written by a critic of the Bible called The Passover Plot. 
And in this book, the critic basically said that Jesus wasn't really the Messiah. He was just a man like anyone else. And that he actually manipulated and orchestrated his own death. But when you read the scriptures, it's so clear that there's a lot of things in the account that Jesus never could have orchestrated or controlled. That of the Roman soldiers throwing dice for his own garment. Certainly, he couldn't have orchestrated the idea that his legs would not be broken, he would be pierced, and that he would be buried in Joseph's tomb, and all of those issues were impossible for him to orchestrate. So it's a theory that's used by unbelievers to try to explain away the person and the work of Jesus Christ. But it was a fulfillment of prophecy. God is in control. Now in verse 25 to 27, we have the background for the second cry that Jesus uttered on the cross. The first he uttered to the thief, today you'll be with me in paradise. It's the cry of salvation. But in verse 25 to 27, we have the background for it and the, the, the statement he made concerning his mother, verse 25. Now there stood by the cross of Jesus, his mother. And any of you mothers that read this, try to imagine what it would be like to stand at the foot of the cross and watch your son being crucified. And there was his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Cleophas, and Mary Magdalene. Then when Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciple standing by whom he loved, he said unto his mother, Woman, behold thy son. Then said he to his disciple, Behold thy mother. And from that hour, that disciple, verse 27, took her into his home. Now, there were four women, verse 25, that were there at the cross. And by this time, John, even though all the disciples had been scattered, he was at the cross as well. But these women are to be commended, and you women should take kind of some a little pride in this, that all the disciples, strong, brave men, are hiding behind locked doors, fearing for their lives, but the women in love are at the foot of the cross with the, uh, watching Jesus crucified. Now, I said there are four women. There's Mary, the mother of our Lord. The Mary reference here is the second only in the Gospel of John. And it's kind of interesting, the only other reference in John's Gospel to Mary was in chapter 2. And you remember the story? It was the story of the wedding feast at Cana when they ran out of wine. It was a joyous occasion of life. People are getting married. And so Mary goes to Jesus and said, you know, they're out of wine. What have I to do with thee? My hour is not yet come. And then he actually turned the water into wine. But it was a time of joyous occasion. Now, the only other reference to Mary in the Gospel of John is here chapter 19 in verse 25 when we see his mother there at the foot of the cross. So it opens with Mary in chapter 2 in a time of joy and celebration. It ends with Mary in chapter 19 at a time of sorrow and grief. Remember when Mary and Joseph took the baby Jesus and Luke's gospel into the temple? And Simeon, the old man, saw the baby Jesus and scooped him out of Mary's arms and held the baby. And he began to prophesy. And he actually said to Mary, a sword shall pierce through your own soul. That was a prophecy fulfilled in this verse. As Mary stood there watching her son die, she knew that he was born of a virgin. She knew he was the Son of God. She knew he was the Messiah, the Savior of the world, and here her own Lord. And she stood there watching her son crucified on that cruel cross. How tragic that must have been for her. Now the next woman was the wife of, or was Mary, the wife of Cleophas, or excuse me, back up, his, his mother's sister, don't want to miss that. That is the woman Salome, Mark chapter 15, verse 40, 
who was actually Mary's sister, and she was John and James's mother, and she was also the wife of Zebedee, who had a fishing business with James and John. So John, the writer of the gospel, had his mother there, who was the sister of Mary, the mother of Jesus. So John and Mary were first cousins, which is fascinating. And then the third woman was the wife of Cleophas. And then the fourth was Mary Magdalene. And Mary Magdalene had been forgiven and saved. She had the demons cast out of her, and she's there at the foot of the cross. So motivated by love. Now Jesus looks down from the cross, verse 26, and sees his mother. And I imagine it must have pained his heart to see her in this anguish of heart as she watched him crucified. And so the disciple standing by, whom he loved, that is a reference to John the Apostle. So Jesus is on the cross. He looks down from the cross. He sees his mother Mary, and he sees the apostle John. Now he said unto his mother, he didn't say mother, he said woman, which is a term of endearment, but he doesn't address her as mother. He said, behold thy son. Now he's not talking about himself. He's talking about John the apostle. And then he said to the disciple, that is John, Behold your mother. And from that hour, that disciple took her, that is Mary, into his own home. This is the cry and the word of affection. Now think about this. Jesus is being executed. He's hanging on the cross. And what does he do? He's concerned for his mother. He's thinking of others. Most of the utterances that Jesus made on the cross were not about himself, not about his pain, He did say, I thirst. He did say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? But most of his utterances were forgiving others and helping others and speaking to others. So he speaks to John and says, behold your mother and to his mother, behold thy son. And John took her from that day into his house. And can you imagine what an awesome blessing that would have been? The hours they talked and late into the night, John the Apostle talking to Mary as they talked about Jesus, the Son of God. What a blessing that was. And this word of affection also brought an end to a human relationship. He turned his mother over to the care of John. Now, the question is, why didn't his own siblings, his own brothers and sisters, which the Scriptures indicate he had, take care of his mother. We don't really know. One of the guesses is, is because they were still unbelievers. You know, at this point, Jesus had brothers and sisters. And if you didn't know that, the Bible talks about them. After Jesus was born, Mary and Joseph consummated their marriage and she had other children. So Jesus was a big half brother, but they weren't unbelievers. They weren't Christians. They didn't believe in Christ. So Jesus perhaps didn't want to commend her to them or their care. Well, what about Joseph? Why doesn't Joseph take care of her? So the obvious conclusion is that Joseph was dead and not around to be able to take care of his mother. But I do think it's interesting that Jesus, even as he was dying on the cross, kept the fifth commandment, Exodus 20, verse 12, which says what? Honor thy father and thy mother. Honor thy father and thy mother. So he wanted to make sure that his mother would be taken care of. In 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 8, Paul told Timothy that if anyone provides not for their own family, their own household, that you deny the faith and you're worse than an infidel. So he was taking care of his mother even in death. And then the second, or the third word, excuse me, and the background for it is in verse 28, and 29. It's the cry of suffering. So after this, Jesus knowing that all things were now accomplished and that the scriptures might be fulfilled. Now, most likely between verse 27 and 28 were the beginning of the three hours of darkness. And I think it was a universal darkness. 
And it was at this time that Jesus cried, Eli, Eli, lama sabbatani, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And because the sins of the world were placed upon Christ, God the Father turned his back temporarily upon his only begotten Son. So Jesus, knowing that the Scripture, verse 28, might be fulfilled, said, here it is, I thirst. That's the shortest statement Jesus uttered on the cross. It's actually, in the Greek, one word. He just cried out, thirst. Now, therefore, they set a vessel full of vinegar. They filled it with a sponge with vinegar, and they put it on hyssop, and they put it to his mouth. Now, earlier in the crucifixion, they put to his lips wine mingled with gall, which was a sedative to try to deaden the pain, and Jesus rejected it. But at this point, they give him sour wine, and Jesus drank it from the hyssop. And the hyssop was actually used by the priest to dip the blood and to sprinkle it on the people during the Passover. It was a plant, and they used it also to put the blood on the doorposts and lintels of their houses in the Passover feast in the Exodus from Egypt. But Jesus basically cries here in his suffering, and this is the only word that would relate to his physical suffering I thirst. So he's hanging on the cross in the heat of the day. God shelters him with the shade, the darkness, but he cries out, I thirst. It speaks of his human suffering. He was God, but he was also a man. He actually physically suffered. Whenever I take communion, one of the things that speaks to me the most is to think that Jesus physically actually suffered and died for me. He felt pain and he was crucified for me. And then it was also a picture of him being an obedient servant, giving his life in obedience to the Father's plan, and also purchasing a great salvation. But his cry, I thirst, was in order that we might not thirst, that we might drink of the salvation, the living water that he offered in John 4 to the woman at the well, and John 7, if any man's thirsty, let him come to me and drink. So Jesus was thirsty and drank so that we could have our thirst quenched when we get to heaven. Actually, we're going to get it Sunday morning in Revelation 7:16. It says, they shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more. And in Revelation 22:17, 17, the last invitation, take the take of the water of life freely. So Jesus died so that we might be satisfied. And then lastly, in verse 30, the last cry in this text is the cry of victory. And this is the greatest cry he uttered on the cross. When Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, it is what? And he bowed his head. The word bowed his head in the Greek is interesting. It actually means he just laid his head back like he was going to sleep on a pillow, that he laid his head back upon the cross. Earlier, Jesus had said, foxes have holes, birds of the air have nests, but I, the son of a man, have nowhere to, very same Greek phrase, lay my head. How amazing was that, that God would come from heaven and have no place to lay his head except for on a cross. And he was suspended between earth and heaven. And it was a reminder there that God the Father had to turn his back and mankind had crucified the Son of God. Someone said he hung upon a cross of wood, but he made the hill on which it stood. The only place that Jesus found to lay his head was on a cross where he died for man's sins. And then he bowed his head and then he gave up the ghost. So he did three things in verse 30. He said, and by the way, he said, the other gospels tell us with a loud voice. So it was a victor's cry. He said, to tell us die, it is finished or paid in full. Then he bowed his head and then he gave up the ghost. Now this word that Jesus uttered, as I said in the Greek, is the word to tell us die. And it literally means to bring to an end, to finish, or complete. And it was used as a very common word 
First of all, by servants, whenever they would do a job and they'd finish the job, they would actually say, to Telestai, it's done. Then it was used by a, a priest when he would examine a lamb for the Passover and he would discover the lamb was without blemish and spot. He would actually say over that lamb, he would say, to Telestai, it's finished, it's ready, it's perfect, it's complete. And then it was used by artists when they were painting a picture or a potter pot, throwing a potter on the wheel and they would finish the last touches of their work of art they would actually utter the word to Telestai. It's finished. It's complete. If you've ever done art or you paint it all, you know that sometimes the very last few touches are the most crucial. You know, you don't want to botch it up or mess it up. So you kind of put the brushes very carefully, put your last little touches on it. And sooner or later, you have to put your brushes down and take your hands off and leave it alone and just say, it is finished. To Telestai. It's done. So Jesus uttered this common word, and then it was used, I love this, by merchants. After a debt was paid in full, they would stamp the receipt with the words in red on the receipt, to Telestai, paid in full. Don't, don't you like receipts like that? I don't like to get receipts that say, balance due, $6,000. Oh... I like that bright red paid in full stamped on that piece of paper. Ah, oh, great. So Jesus uttered this word to Telestai, bowed his head, and gave up the ghost. There's so much that can be said about this, and I've actually preached a seven-week sermon on, seven-week series on each one of these utterances. But it, it implies what Jesus came to do is finished. And what did he come to do? To give his life as a ransom for many. He came to die on the cross, and it's finished. You go, well, he hasn't risen from the dead yet, but he knew that it was complete. He knew that it was done. He knew that it was fulfilled. It is done. It is finished. So we as Christians speak of what we call the finished work of Christ. And when we trust Jesus to save us, we're resting in, listen to me very carefully, the finished work of Jesus Christ. All other religions say do. Christianity says done. Nothing more to do. The price has already been paid. All you need to do is appropriate it by faith or trusting Jesus who died on the cross for your sins. So what you're doing when you become a Christian is you're entering in by faith to the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. That's why once you're saved, you don't have to try to perform to be saved. You don't try to earn your salvation. It's already finished. It's already done. So all you have to do is thank him. When you hold the cup tonight and the bread, just give him thanks for the work that he's already done and finished on the cross. It is finished. It is complete. It is done. There's a great book if you ever want to read it. It's called The Cross of Christ. It's written by John R.W. Stott. And I only recommend it because I've read it a few times, and it is amazing. And I've never forgotten these three th ways he summarized the work of the cross in that book. The first is salvation. God rescued sinners. The second is revelation. God revealed himself. And the third is conquest. God in Christ defeated the devil. Now, the cross is the greatest subject of the Bible. It is the central theme of the Bible. The Bible is all about God's redemption in Christ. So all Old Testament history leads up to the cross. All New Testament history points back to the cross. And it's the central theme of all of God's revelation, the cross of Jesus Christ. That's why Paul said, God forbid that I should boast except in the cross of my Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me and I unto the world. So there's nothing more important in the life of the Christian than understanding the substitutionary death of Jesus on the cross. He died to save us and rescue us 
It's a redemption on the cross. And then he died to reveal himself. It's called the theater of the cross. God revealed his love and his grace and his mercy and his holiness and his righteousness and his justice. All of the attributes of God are seen in the theater of the cross. And then the conquest of the cross is that Jesus defeated the devil. And then he rose victoriously from the grave. Amen? That's the work of the cross. So God forbid that we should glory except in one thing, the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. And in the cross, the world is dead to us and we're dead to the world. And we want to live in the power of the cross. And we come to the cross to be forgiven and we stay at the cross to learn to be forgiving toward others. If God has forgiven you, how can you not forgive others? Amen? Let's pray.